All right, my name is Jeff Cheel. Um, I'm a pre-sales manager for Chili Publish based in the United States. Uh, the presentation today is the second part of uh, a presentation series we're doing throughout the month. Um, today is going to be um, a little bit of uh, kind of a white paper conversation or basically Chili's opinion on digital packaging out there in the market. Um, it's understanding a little bit where, where our product fits into classical packaging, uh, where we've kind of developed as a company and some of the trends that we see now might be speaking to companies that often do digital packaging yourself and whether you're on the production side or the brand side, um, these are just opinions and trends that we see. And some of it might be going back to the start of where digital packaging came from and what the core of packaging is. But I think it's a good reminder of really what these concepts are and why we have them and some best practices and ways in order to make it work. Now, we will be tying Chile in at the end. Uh, understanding uh, where our product fits and, and some of the benefits that it brings into the industry. So a little bit of chili at the end, but, um, you know, make this a general idea of digital packaging and understand, especially from a customization company like ourselves, where we really see this product fitting in into the industry. So we'll get started a little bit today uh, going way back. And I know this is going to seem a little crazy, but um, in the history and, and really where did packaging come from? And uh, you know, if we take a look at the concept and kind of where packaging started, um, it was a very utilitarian product. We're creating packages for goods. They were really just a method um, for productivity or protection um, from place to place, and especially for transportation. If we're um, transporting a product from one city to another, we needed to create some kind of container that will bring it over and pass it along. Now, different places came up with different packaging and different processes and different methods and different places that it would send would require different packaging. If I had materials like clay pots, I could make clay containers. Um, if I had wood, um, based on my society, I could make wooden packages. So really utilitarian, really coming from different places. Now, there was some idea of brand loyalty or brand uh, awareness. Um, based on the package, I would know where it's coming from, maybe what country I'm trading with. So there was some uniqueness to the packaging that was being created, but it was very much still a utilitarian product. Now, brand awareness really didn't come out um, until much, much later. And really, some of this came really from um, utility still, but really came from um, different trends in different parts as we've gone through history. Now, we'll speak back to Napoleon and, uh, you know, a big... Uh, impact that he actually had on the packaging industry. Uh, Napoleon at one point offered uh, 12,000 francs to any man who could develop a method to preserve his army's food products. And he sent out this as a call to his country in order to create innovation. And a man named uh, Nicholas Uphart um, built glass jars and decided to start sealing them with cork and wax and really started to create the idea of uh, a unique product uh, packaging something that really could be catered to its particular goods. Then it was used for many, many years, and especially as war has gone on and utility has increased, we started to see different materials being used, and especially in uh, World War I, where tin cans started to be used even more and more, and especially as products were being imported across the seas, coming from Canada into the United States, we started to need more and better shipping materials. Now, these shipping materials started to have some kind of labels and branding, depending on where it was coming from. So customization started to go up as people saw the need and the utility in order to label their products depending on where they were coming from or how they were being sent. Now, World War II led to even more innovation. Now, as these labels got more and more creative, we started to use different materials, aluminum, plastics, cellophane, etc. So as these packages started to get more and more creative, the branding started to get more and more creative too. Different wood, different cardboard, different materials started to uh, allow for different opportunities in order to continue to brand our products. Now this whole experience also created a different way in order for these products to be shipped. As we see the different custom packaging throughout the world, we started to go to different methods and different ways that we would shop. Um, and let's talk about um, the stores that were being used during that time. Um, you know, the different ways that were being shopped, we went from shopping at a grocery store into a self-service store. So a general store, we started to get into um, the unique self-service stores. And as we would be self-service, as our users would start to go shelf by shelf and look at the product, there was even more of a need for branding. Especially as if I'm walking along, I need to be able to see that product and our advertising changed too. Especially as we talked about the self-service product, we wanted to start branding that. And talking about the materials that were being used and the advertisements that were being seen. And now these self-service portals really became individual marketing. 
And now I had the ability to put my logo on top of a package and really create brand loyalty. So we go all the way back from a utilitarian purpose when packaging was created to changing shopping trends to when I was shopping for myself and now the ability to utilize packaging for branding, to put my company logo on it, to really attach a user to my product and really drive them towards a purchase. Now, we make a big jump past the individual and we get into marketing trends now. And even though we're jumping many, many years, we start to talk about now the different ways that people approach brands. As we've seen brands over the years, I'm now not only attaching myself to brands, but I'm attaching myself as a brand. And now myself as a Twitter user or as a social media user, the individual now takes that brand and shares it with the world. I'm constantly broadcasting my life, constantly talking about what I'm doing, I'm not only say that I'm eating something, I'm eating Domino's pizza. I'm drinking something, I'm drinking a Coca-Cola. I'm really sharing that brand out in the world. Now, this individual still stays in place, but the idea is that brand loyalty is going down. Now, brand loyalty is declining. Look at how quickly like Nokia shoppers switch from Samsung and Apple. The minute that people lose that brand loyalty or lose a product, um, lose the trust in the product, they'll immediately jump to another one because choices are going up. We have so many options that people will eventually and quickly move to that new option the minute that they lose trust in that product. Now, this is not something that's happened recently. We've actually seen this trend go over the years. And even all the way back to 2011, uh, CPG brands were seeing huge drops in common off-the-shelf products. Now, super stores were creating cheaper and cheaper home products, so we weren't just seeing P&G fighting with other big uh, CPG brands. We were seeing Walmart putting out their home brand, being able to do larger volume products for cheaper. Now, price became a product here too. So if I could buy you know, the generic paper towels, I would because ut utility went up, price went down, and so brand loyalty went out the window. And so it didn't mean as much for me to say that I'm a, you know, a Huggies guy. I could just buy the cheapest diapers off the shelf and go from there. Now, I'm not claiming that digital packaging or web to print will immediately solve this. Let's understand that. Now, there's no immediate solve, but it came to play, however, the important role that strategy has in this whole campaign. Um, Steve Van Bellingham says, um, the solution is not to be found in the marketing department alone. So we can't just make our packaging brighter more colorful, we need to really understand what the shopping experience is like and how that brand is really being attached to a person. And especially, it's not just to buy a product, it's really what has that product done for me and what has it done over time and why do I like this product when it comes to why do I want to share it with my friends. And we're asking more for the individual. And we're saying in a study from 2015, 70% of marketers say they want to invest in the personalization of the customer's experience. So it's not just the personalization of the product. And that's a big thing when we talk about packaging. It's the understanding that we're not just providing a package that reaches out to a person. It's really the experience of that shopping experience from the website to the ordering experience to the product coming to me, but also in the utility and the container. How am I receiving it? what is being sent to me from the email campaign, et cetera. So really that customer experience from a larger strategy investment is really what's becoming important. And these are what these products really understand. Now, similar to the supermarket revolution, we're seeing a tremendous increase in online purchasing. The idea is that people don't want to go into the brick and mortar stores anymore. They're really utilizing the online tools of websites in order to order these products. Now, that's even more of a price too, but that definitely does reach out to us and say, if I'm ordering it online, how do I make that online experience even more important? How do I really grab onto people, attach them to myself from a brand perspective, really make them feel part of the whole experience? When it comes to shipping goods, you turn back the purpose of packaging. Now, understand that these online sites, eBay, Amazon, all these different products have one purpose, to get the product to me as quick as possible. But the idea is that that brand attachment, that brand awareness is going out the window. We're throwing more utility to get shipping costs down. So we're doing more standardization. We're losing a big opportunity here in order to help our brand experience. If I go on Amazon and order a collection of products, I get that box. It's gray. It's boring. It's off the shelf. I'm not sharing with the world what products I'm buying. I don't see them as I put them in my shopping cart. We don't share that experience. So we're losing a big opportunity here in order to really crap onto people and really help them attach. Now, there's a few that have recognized this, and Cool Blue is one big example. Now, Cool Blue decided to look outside of the box. 
They started to interact with their customers and actively encourage them to engage with the brand itself. Now, they are a brand. They're representing other products, but they still are a brand itself. Now, how customized can we make our product? How can we help identify and attach to people as we go? They started to make the box more useful. Some funny quotes and thank you cards for neighbors who've accepted delivery. Maybe they'll ask to send pictures of how customers would use and accept the box as they go. So really reaching out, making a brand on the product itself and grabbing. So from a product standpoint, it's just another opportunity. Looking outside of the box and finding another touch point where we can really reach out to people. And sometimes it can even be the brands that are being provided. Maybe Amazon works in conjunction with um, Procter & Gamble in order to make these packages more customized. So maybe printing boxes with logos on them or providing a certain type of box for certain products. So really trying to increase value and using advertising dollars upstream in order to help with the experience of the product rather than just taking a product and putting more colors on the package. The key here is interactivity. And standard boxes can be considered boring by the modern customer. They miss out on the appealing need or opportunity really to engage them on an individual standpoint. But interactivity is not easy if you make it hard for the customer as well. The idea is that we can't just have a campaign like this where we don't provide an easy step. If I look at this box, where's the QR code? How hard is it for me to attach to the brand? And we have a very short attention span from people in order to interact. So we don't make it clear to them that's going to be a big thing. And from a packaging company standpoint, you need to reach back out to the brands. Reach back out to these agencies that are developing these campaigns. This is our major first point of the conversation today. If you see these campaigns not working, it's up to us as the producers in order to communicate that back to the brands and say, if we're putting it on the wrong place, if we're not understanding how the package works, your campaigns are going to fail. And that's going to immediately make packaging campaigns not look so competitive, or not look so competent. So we need to have two-way communication about what works. And so really the agency here should have been communicated to say, maybe let's redesign this product, make it more efficient. Especially as we get into more folded campaigns and more interactivity. I mean, this campaign right here for uh, Monarch Ski Campaign has uh, augmented reality. A lot of money went into this campaign. We need to be able to help test it. We need to be able to put it out in the market and show that the interactivity was easy enough and accessible enough for people in order to really grab it and start pushing it back. Now, if I look at this product, it has so much value. It's not just a printed good. It's really utilizing this technology, really finding the right way in order to make it draw. Now, here was another great campaign. This was uh, interactive stamps. The idea of using QR codes, really looking at that stamp and maybe sending a video to a person that you're mailing something to. So another campaign that really had a lot of value. You have to make the campaign easy. You have to make it simple in order to draw. And if we don't make it simple and make it direct, people won't use it. So really utilizing those two campaigns in order to really drive that conversation. Here's another one, DIY packaging, really even taking a box that you have something shipped in, really giving somebody maybe even some instructions about how to take it, build it, and put it into your home. It's all utilitary. And the minute that people have this technology, they're going to end up using it. Now, another point I want to make here is that really for years, especially QR codes, I think we've seen technology move faster than implementation. QR codes have been around for years, and I think the big frustration is the right way to use them, especially if we look at campaign like the interactive stamps and uh, interactive barcodes using augmented reality. I think the technology has been there, but people have really struggled to find the right way in order to grab the user and really help them interact. And we need to be the leaders in this because we see brands doing it right. People are really grabbing onto it and finding successful campaigns, and the value of doing it right is you set the new bar you start to redefine how this technology be, is being used. Especially if we look at this video campaign for stamps, if this becomes the use, well, people are gonna download more QR readers, people are gonna understand the technology better. And so really the case has just been finding the right way to do things, finding the right way to take advantage. And especially as we go forward, new technology is gonna come out eventually more quick again than the things that we can provide. I know videos, interactive videos, uh, Augmented reality continues to be another piece. Well, the minute that we can master that aspect, the minute that we can understand that technology quicker, then we can really set the tone and you can help as the producer be the drive to that, really help the brand set the new standard 
especially the value that that has out in the market. Um, really, you know, working with them in order to create successful campaigns, it adds so much value to the brand if they're being talked about as the person that gets it. I mean, even on social media, the first team that understood the right way to tweet and really the right way to put on Facebook messages became the new de facto standard about the way that Facebook was being used. So if you become the one with even DIY packaging, even really setting the standard here, this just becomes another main piece. So it's finding the right agencies and brands that want to go outside of the box. It's understanding it. And it's really pushing it forward. Now, getting away from the concept itself, let's get into the production keys and understanding the productivity and really the production as it combines and as it pairs up with the concepts that we have. Now, we understand that um, interactivity inevitably leads to more individual approach and therefore digital packaging is so important. And we understand that Packaging doesn't just involve adding lights or making it flash. It's really about making that package really valuable to the user and really understanding it more. And there are three really key elements in digital packaging. First one is going to be the printing technique itself. Choosing the right technology really depends on the specific print preference. We understand your packaging is really going to depend on the quality, the quantity, and the price of the goods that we're producing. We understand that every job is going to fit those categories, and so you as the producer have to make the choice, especially as you're presenting this job to a printing or to an agency or to a brand in order to produce. These big qualities are going to be um, dependent on the flexibility you have down the line. A certain quantity and a certain quality becomes uh, important at a certain price. So if they like a cheap product, we have really limitations about how many we can produce and the quality that we can produce too. Toner-based solutions have been around for many years. Um, and the inkjet revolution is really unstoppable. So as digital printing is getting better, we know that run lengths are going down, more jobs are moving to those inkjet or digital presses. A Smith & reports in 2015 predicts that by 2018, a majority of digital printing in the packaging industry will be done on inkjet presses. Let me say that again. By 2018, the majority of digital printing in the packaging industry will be done on inkjet presses. The idea is that we're getting away from the traditional methods of producing print packaging because the value of individual um, production, the uh, value of personalization is going up. So we are matching the quality with the quantity with the press. These presses are becoming more and more price conscious. And now it's a standard that we're really moving to the inkjet type packaging industry or the inkjet type production in the future. Now, the second element is convention versus digital. And I know this speaks a little bit to the production from before, but just understand this too. Conventional print, um, very key when it comes to uh, multiple copies of the same product or really single copies of uh, different products. Can I create personalization using digital? Can I go away from that? And I understand the price is really dependent on conventional versus digital, really the impact of those two pieces, but it really does set the trend as we go to. So understand, especially as you're working on investments in the future, working on what offers you're going to provide as a print shop, really how much are we going to invest in our digital offering as opposed to our conventional offering. Now, the thing that ties all of this together from the digital aspects, the toner-based print and everything else is really the data that drives these campaigns. And I know big data is a big piece for a lot of companies. Print shops are now turning into data mining shops. They're turning into data management shops. They're really adding more capabilities to themselves. And as a shock, they've gone away from the traditional approach and really been um, tasked with being um, data programmers and um, you know, uh, really organize, organizers of uh, PIM systems and CRMs and all these other technologies that never really tied into the print shop before. But now this print shop is really taking on the task. Now, big data is not just a buzzword. It's really a key element, especially as brands start to engage with their audience. The brand is being tasked with understanding more about their user. So I, as a brand, especially Coca-Cola or Pepsi, need to understand my user. And especially from a print shop perspective, I need to be able to ingest that data and understand it more as it comes to my user. And if I can't take in the data from my brand, I become behind the times. 
I have the technology, but really the data is what drives it. Personalization is really being driven by how well I process that data, how my technology speaks and works together, how these pieces connect and really interact. And so this big data initiative coming from brands really comes down on the printer but now needs to be able to handle this. And I know talking to print shops, print shops are now hiring programmers. They're hiring data miners. They're hiring technology leaders in order to be ahead of the game. And now they're developing new teams that never existed before. And the traditional shops have caught up with it. New print shops are ahead of the game. It's really a shock seeing where the investment is going to go in the future as it all kind of fits together. Now, if we think back to some of these products like that Australian Post product that we saw, you know, the interactivity really connects the dots, especially as I start to understand when somebody interacts with a campaign and, and think about that um, the interactive barcode that we saw before. When somebody scans it, I collect the information about the scanner. I see where that product is being sent to. So I understand the origin of the product and the destination of the product. I understand a little bit about my user. So I'm getting a better feel for who's using the product, where they're coming from, maybe their demographic. I have abilities to collect information. And what I'm getting is a big overall picture of users and how they're working on it. Now, as a brand, I have the task to understand what I can do with that information. As I see that single source of truth, I'm now tasked with where can I use that information? How can I pass it out? How can I repurpose it? Now, the big challenge is going to be establishing the rules about these data campaigns. And I think the fear here is as we start to interact, th there are no rules. It's the Wild West. What kind of personalization can I send to users? What's too much? And what's too little? And I'm going to tell you a, a really good story of, about a brand backfiring on themselves. Worked for Target a few years back in digital advertising. And they would collect up data on their users that visited the website. And they would pair that data up with print campaigns. So I, as a user, I go on Target. I look at the different campaigns or I look at different sections. And me, as a user, I know that user A looks at electronics and looks at car and automobile. And now I can create personalized products for my users. Now, Target really looked at this as a value. They wanted to reach coupons and different campaigns to that user to give them specific value based on my user experience. Well, they had kind of a backfiring experience. Um, a, a, a father, a family of four, um, was receiving information in the mail. And part of their campaigns was um, diapers and strollers and other baby uh, information. Now, the father got a little pissed off. He said, Target, um, you're sending me information about things that don't mean anything to me. I want electronics. I want things that, that mean something to me. We don't have any babies anymore in our house. Why are you getting this information? Now, Target, from their data department, responded back and said, well, from your IP address, we've actually been getting users who are looking in the baby section on our website. And what the father found out is that his daughter was pregnant and he didn't know about it. And so from this collection of data, he was actually getting extreme personalization in a way that even he didn't know. And so Target kind of took a hit publicly about using that information, really drawing it forward and really drawing the line between what information do you know about me that you can apply to me and what information maybe is a little bit too sensitive and what seems to be crossing the line and how it seems to approach. I know other approaches too, especially when things are too personalized and I'm not accepting information that I'm giving, it becomes even more important. I know when I get an email campaign from somebody um, about something that I didn't necessarily sign up for, uh, maybe I was retargeted or my information was sold off, I lose value in the brand immediately, and I lose trust in where I'm passing my information to. And so the single source of truth from the brand perspective, it's very important to know how that information is being sent out. So it may not be as important on the print side, because we're just tasked with creating the campaigns that people tell us to do. But understand that there's a big understanding about that data and really what's more important and what's not. And since there's no overarching kind of rules that are being set on what's kind of copacetic or what's uh, approved or what's kind of uh, ethically okay to share, these rules are applying over time and really starting to create. And I think in the end, that information is going to be leveled off. I think there's going to be some accepted things about myself that are okay. Obviously, my name is public knowledge. So you can name something after me. Maybe the state that I come from is really important. Um, some general pieces of approved information are really key. And then we're going to understand that as I interact with the brand, maybe if I get to level two or level three and I start to order a product for myself, maybe then those products 
can really tie into more personalized information. And maybe in the target example, it was, oh, if I create a baby registry, then maybe you send me products about babies. You know, if I do certain things, maybe those are new triggers. So we start to understand more levels about where products fit and about how we interact with them to understand when we start to execute on campaigns. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. And I think we're still trying to figure out where all that's coming from. Now, when we start to get into personalization, uh, we'll kind of tie into online editing for the first time tonight. How do the tools that are out there in the market make our job easy? And if we look at this Whitworth example and all the different kind of personalization and the different products that are out there in the world, from a production standpoint, it's a big challenge. We see what, three, six, seven different smaller packages, three larger packages, three handheld packages, et cetera. These are all different templates that are being used in production. Now, from a marketing standpoint, it becomes a nightmare trying to make sure that each of these products are updated as a color gets updated or a product imagery gets updated. How do we update things across the board? Well, a production tool like Chili out there in the world um, allows you in order to store different sizes in the same piece of artwork. So using alternate layouts in order to control three different sizes of a template, easily change text, update colors. From a production standpoint, from a personalization standpoint, it's a great tool. And this is really what, from a print standpoint, is becoming more important. We're selling our product in more productivity tools, in more uh, workflow tools that allow production to easily respond and quickly respond to brands. If they say, well, we need to get Red Berry Crunch back on press very quickly, the quicker that I can get it through production, push it through my online template, update my copy, get it through approval, the quicker I can get it on press, the quicker I can react to the market that's out there in the world, and the quicker that I can really be involved in the decision making that's being happening. Now, conventionally, again, this would be a nightmare managing it all through. The online editor, we can really limit this down to even three or even one template, make it very easy. Now, we start to get into the ization's of the world, the ways that things are becoming more personalized, the way that becoming, things are becoming more um, flexible in the world. And we really kind of drive this um, chart as a way to understand it even more. Really seeing that um, a higher level of standardization implies designs is less individual. So as my standardization goes up, my variability goes down. Now, um, the higher level of variability implies more standardization. So as my variability goes down, the number of copies that I'm creating goes down as well. My individualization can go up. So really, as you can see, the flow is my flexibility goes up as I start to become more and more standard in my product or less and less standard in my product. So we're understanding that as the brand is driving towards individualization, we're producing less copies. And we looked at the production schedule earlier. These presses are really what's driving that decision. If I have presses that can do one-off copies, well, I can make my runs less, I can do more customization, I can really drive to the individual user. The different ization levels that you see here, from the individualization to the customization to the regionalization, is depending on the level of variability and standardization. So now, as this chart goes, we're going to see at what level you can really reach out to. You know, if I'm a brand or if I'm a production company and I'm reached with, you know, standard packaging, well, I can reduce my costs. I can really produce my copies at a high level, but my flexibility goes way down. If I really want to make a regional product, I have some different level of flexibility. So we're going to go through now these kind of four levels of ization's from the standardization to regionalization, customization, etc. The first thing we hit is regionalization. Now, regionalization is the element of packaging when we're differing from region to region. So if I'm out there in the world and I'm trying to decide a different language or a different country that I'm shipping to, I can now create things by region. Now, a lot of this region is depending on legislation. Different rules apply in different regions. This isn't just uh, limited to maybe the name on a product or the language that I'm using. Really different countries may be required different things. You know that in the U.S. I have different packaging requirements than over in Europe. And so as I start to build out this regionalization, I can start to recognize what needs to be sent in what place. Now those decisions are going to be driven by data. As my database is growing more and more as I start to build out different regions, I can start to then pair that data up with my template builder in order to quickly produce my product. So if I'm Coca-Cola and I like to produce a production platform that allows any producer out there in the world to reach in, grab the product that's most applicable to them locally, what I can do is I can create these campaigns that take one template, 
drive different data information depending on where they're located in order to create the template for them. We have a great um, partnership with a company called Gates. Gates produces packaging here in the United States. Gates wanted the ability to create quick regionalization of their products. They were using standard shells and they were doing um, laser printing on top of it. Well, they really wanted the ability to make this regionalization even more important. As product information was changing, as maybe a logo needed to change out, they really needed to change their press. So they invested in um, a new digital press. And in getting that digital press, they needed a technology that helped pair along with it. So they started to use Chile in order to drive their database to these products. And now, as they order per region, as maybe California or maybe New York orders a product and they're printing it locally, what they can do is they can tie in that regionability to that product and say, okay, this state requires this requirements from a legal standpoint, so we can drive that product too. Now, regionalization can stand far beyond displaying legal information on the product. You could, for example, really personalize that logo. We just talked about it again. If I'm producing in China, I can produce a Chinese version of my product, et cetera, and I can now drive that through one individual platform. We understand, especially from marketing teams, the quicker we can approve these products, the better. And so utilizing a product like Chili in order to help that personalization with compared to data helps my approval process. We, in fact, we use uh, our tool with a few big packaging companies in pharma out there in the world. And we understand that the quicker a design gets to legal as kind of the big step point, you know, the quicker we can get onto shelves. And so um, a team utilizes Chile along with a great data implementation in order to produce regionalized labels. And as those labels get quickly through production, utilizing Chile plus data, we can help them through the process a lot quicker. Now this is really most valuable when we're talking about language shift from one version to another. But um, as you can see, we talked, you know, there is an ability to, to kind of scale this stuff out. Now, regionalization, especially the product that we see here, does have some standardization. We understand as these products go um, and as these pieces go, there's a big fit in price and where we can fudge your price. So in this situation, you see that the package stays consistent. We're producing the same dye line every time. We may be able to standardize some of the colors, maybe some of the foil stamping and some of the embossing that we can use, but we're looking for small kind of creative ways in order to personalize this product as you go. And that kind of takes us to even into um, personalization. Now here, this is another example of regionability. Um, different logos for different regions, just another very small element that can be changed up where um, it's a lower level or it's a higher level of customization. So maybe not as in-depth down to the one, but we can still provide some customization for regions. Now, customization is another level two, and, and this really gets into uh, even more alterization or altering of the product. Um, this might include an application option such as um, you know changing a picture changing a color scheme and a theme, really providing even more customization. Now, this seasonalization and customization requires even more of a, a template and response by the marketing team. It's one thing to change out a logo. That's a very easy thing to get through approval. But if I would like to add a new campaign, if I'm an um, agency and I'm starting up a Christmas campaign, I need a tool that especially might use something like Chili that can quickly react to that. How quickly can I change an image? How quickly can I change uh, type and you know add a new logo? Because from a production standpoint, we've already kind of addressed that. Our production runs are going lower and lower with our production tools. How can we respond from a brand standpoint? And giving brands the tools like Chili in order to change out a campaign within our specs, but really add a new color scheme, add new imagery, get it approved, et cetera, that really adds a big value. Now, customization can also imply that packaging for a product is made in different flavors or models. So especially as we start to add custom uh, flavors or limited runs of a product, that's another way that customization can really become important. I know if I'm Mars or M&Ms and I want to produce a seasonal good of uh, a new product, well, if I can tie that into a marketing campaign or a marketing tool, I can quickly create my peppermint M&Ms by tying into these templates and quickly releasing them to my team. So it's a case of customization for these products tying into marketing tools and really providing that. And if I'm a print shop, it's giving Mars an easy tool for them to update their own artwork, get it quickly through production, put it on press. And so I can react as a producer 
as quickly as my brands can react as a brand. Now, when is this most valuable? Um, when you want to standardize documents based on packaging or die cuts, but you'd like to create different creativity. So yes, we're still talking about standardization, but we really push the customization of that product as large as we can. Now, this is a great example. Coca-Cola wants to produce you know, standard labels for a lot of their users, but now we need the tools in order to customize individual products as we go. So tying in even more data. If I'm producing... Um, bottles and cans for the individual user, I need the tools that can really pair that together. Now even Twix too is a great example. They released uh, a temporary campaign of Twix based on an old game called Reader. And so for a short time in the Netherlands, they produced a one-off special retro campaign in order to reach out to users. So they didn't need to change the press. They didn't need to overhaul. This wasn't a big cost perspective for them to go against. Now, a campaign like this 20 years ago, especially when we were talking about standard print production specifications, would have cost so much money. Changing out the presses, stopping the presses to change out the plates, really creating this, that would not be a cost-effective solution. Well, as the technology really provides it, that's really going to change. And this is another example of a brand working with a print producer to understand value. How quickly can I create a retro logo? How quickly can I interact with my users to get more attention and keep people talking? And if me as the producer could quickly produce this new version at a short run, I can utilize that brand. I could really be um, a big value to my company in order to produce it. Now, the final step, of course, is individualization. It's really the idea of letting a user create a product from themselves. Now, we would separate the cells out from customization because individualization really um, implies that a user themselves is creating this design for them. Now, individual covers more than just personalization. Personalization tends to be a somewhat burned term, especially as people associate it with simply adding someone's name and address to a document. Individualization is actually much broader in our minds. It's uh, making that document unique to the individual. This can include the name and address, but it also can include images, shapes, and colors. And maybe even the entire packaging can be tailored to one person. Name, address, favorite color, shapes, best response to, and even preferred fonts. So really providing them as much creativity as we possibly can. I know we get a lot, especially in our editor, of can I just update my name in a document? Can I just put in my name in a field and my name shows up? The other thing is, can I really take that document and make it my own? Can I use my own font? Can I use my own color? Can I create a custom color? Can I really drive that personalization down to itself? So where we as Chile really reach the market is not only providing templates that can be updated because online editors have been available for years. The idea is personalizing that document to the level that we feel comfortable and allowing them to create that feel for themselves. And I think the difference too is when we talk about you know, invitations or boxes or greeting cards that are out there in the world, the idea is, do I find a template that matches me and put in my name and update it? Or do I start to really trust users to allow them to move elements on the page, to really design it for themselves? And really, you know, at what level can they be the end designer and really personalize it? Because when they're successful, when they use the tool and it means something to them, brand loyalty and, re and retention goes way up. So the minute that I can make a product that really feels for myself, the better off I'm going to be. Now, uh, we as a company, Chili, really want to push it out there that this gets into an idea of profitability. We understand for a lot of companies, profitability needs to be balanced between individualization. What features can we add? How special can we make a product and still make it cost effective? I know that as I start to design this piece, if I'm adding more colors, I need to be aware of how those colors are being run through production. So if I'm allowing somebody to add in a custom color, is it a spot color? Is it going to match? We need to create the rules that make these products most cost effective. So we can't just allow somebody to build their own design knowing what that cost is going to be. We have to know what our limitations are and where they fit. So some standardization is still required, especially in the box that we see here. We still need the box and the panels to be consistent. We need people to be able to build within the constraints that we see. And maybe we even need to keep certain items in certain places. 
like maybe they can't move a barcode because barcodes for shipping need to be in certain places. So we need to be able to control that. And especially from a standardization standpoint, we even know that Chile provides a big value in allowing you to constrain your documents in the right way. Point sizes from certain ways, um, keeping items within certain um, bleed regions and safe regions, et cetera. So creating control um, where there needs to be. Um, creating personalization, but within boundaries. So understanding your cost perspective to go along with the personalization perspective too. Now, when is this most valuable? Um, no doubt the approach provides the ultimate customer experience. We know that especially as if I'm going on a website and creating a personalization for myself, um, that is really where the value becomes clear. And especially if we look at Coca-Cola, we're not just ordering a product. I'm now even pushing this out to customize my package to customize the box that's being sent to me. So it's really providing not only a personalized product, but really an experience and you know an overall kind of brand awareness as I go. Now, another thing too here could be um, Vedette. Uh, it was one of the first to really produce customized labels in the world, but they even took it a step further. They started using Twitter icons or avatars on these bottles for users. And then they even started using those avatars out in the world. So really even putting those icons in stores and finding them. So a value would be going into your local store in your region and maybe even finding the bottle with your picture on it. So, um, you know, having some uh, awareness of a campaign to say, wow, there's a, a bottle out there with my face. Maybe I want to go to a store and try to find it. So can I find ones for myself, my friends, et cetera. So really finding a way to make um, a two-way communication with a brand um, really uh, interactive. Another one here was Walker's. Uh, created a campaign of using names again, um, and this even got into the Flexo world. So really taking other technologies where the technology is catching up as the print processes change. So how can we take advantage of these campaigns again? It's one thing to produce a postcard with my name on it. It's another thing to really see a package out there in the world that uh, has my name on it. So um, as that technology increases, it's it's where can these campaigns go? And we start to see this everywhere from Nutella to Heinz to um you know, wine bottles that can be customized. We have a, a, a big portion of the industry that's going towards um, creating wine labels for weddings. Uh, we've sold a few licenses to, to uh, you know, craft beer companies who want to do um, individual runs for different production, especially if I'm, you know, getting married and my um, beer bottles need to have, you know, my, uh, myself and my fiance uh, with a picture on it. You know, it's the ability to not only produce that because the production has been around, but the tools in order to create that. And so how effective as a print company can I make that tool to be used? Can I put that online? Can I provide the tool for my users to use? Now, at this point, I want to take you through, um, you know, where Chile fits into this whole process. And I'm going to quickly show you one or two documents where this becomes uh, important and how uh, this tool really interacts. Uh, on our spicy beer company, we have an example of a product, uh, a beer label. We can go back to the beer label example that we just talked about. The idea is if I'm an individual user and I'm designing this label for myself, this can be paired off with uh, a website. I log in, I find my product, I'm interacting with the spicy beer product. I'm collecting that information about that user. They become a user, maybe I put them on my loyalty list. So from a data perspective, I'm really seeing their data as I go. Now inside the product, I can instantly interact with it, I can instantly design this product for myself. Now this product can be done on a website, I can do this on my mobile device as we get into our HTML5 editor. But the idea is really driving this product for my end user. Now not only can I change the name on this product, but I can also maybe even do my name or a picture. So I can actually input an image of myself. And so brand loyalty goes up as I really start to customize this. But going back to the principles that we see, we don't allow a user to maybe change the barcode. We don't allow them to put in legal information that we know needs to be there. So we can limit what's being interacted with and what's not. Now a user can see this product, they like it. Maybe they upload an image for themselves. So we're really providing an online tool for them to customize that as they go. I see the product for myself, and I can now even see a, a preview of this for myself too and see how this product is going to look. So now we've tied in our 3D capabilities to go with this product to be able to see this product in action. And now from a production standpoint, I can make sure that my label looks properly, especially with my image on there. 
and make sure that I like it before I place that order. So it's utilizing an online tool. Now, a tool like this, you know, five, 10 years ago was a very custom production from a company to be able to produce. You now, Chile has found a way to produce, um, you know, a modular piece that can be used by even smaller printing companies. A technology that can be easily implemented, templates easy to build. So now even the smaller print shops that maybe never even saw this as um, a revenue stream or a tool that can be utilized, really are starting to utilize it now. And especially the small print shops, they're re utilizing or realizing that this is a requirement now. This is not just um, a flashy feature. You know, we knew that, um, you know, online portals especially have to become more important. And we've seen this over the last, you know, three to five years. The small print shop needs to produce the online portal. They need to allow a user to take advantage of the production tools that they have. Can I create a site that's business to consumer? I know that um, a lot of the, um, you know, uh, education print shops that are producing yearbooks, producing um, banners for schools, producing signage for individual universities, they need to be more customized. They need to create these products a lot quicker. And so a big piece for them is going to be personalization and packaging to be able to create these products on the fly, creating tools that can be really customized and, and brand loyalty ties into that. So it's providing tools like this for quick interaction for, for quick adaptation. And we see not only the print shops buying it, but even smaller brands, you know, not only just Coca-Cola doing this anymore, but if I'm an upstart, if I'm a small brand, I can now use tools like this in order to help my brand add more value. So, you know, the dot coms of the world that are jumping up, they can utilize tools like this to really reach out and interact with their final users. Now we've interacted with packaging over the years. Um, you know, especially if we get into that beer package that we saw before, the idea is really seeing that print package and understanding it for yourself. And so I'll show you um, that package that we saw, the 12 pack from before. It's giving a user um, as much understanding about the product before they place that order. So it's not just submitting my name and really seeing it. It might even be seeing the whole product itself on the website. It's being able to upload that image. So, you know, as we load this document to the user, they can easily change out their imagery, they can easily update their colors, they can easily change out their copy, and they can do this all within your website. So loading a document like this is even key, and as I design this, we can even utilize the 3D folding that we provide within Chile to preview this product. Now Chile, as we go, especially in our new release uh, for packaging, we have a few different um, 3D capabilities that we provide with our new release including uh, embossing, foil stamping, even varnishes as we can apply lighting effects to our pieces. So it's giving another level of customization to your user, especially as we're getting into more finishing capabilities. So not only can I change the name on my product, but I can maybe even update where uh, my varnish is gonna go. So it's utilizing spot varnishes in digital processes. So we'll kind of wrap our presentation up um, what is the concept? Well, the idea is, of course, trying to balance out productivity with saving money. And it's how we're making money as opposed to how we're saving money. And it's understanding that your investment in technology, as you as a printing company are investing more and more in the presses that you have on the, on the floor, you're really investing more in the data infrastructure that you're building around them the tools that you're providing to your brands, to your users in order to utilize those. And so as an ecosystem, you're creating productivity tools and production tools that match up to your productivity tools upfront. How quickly can I get items on press by providing online portals, ordering systems, and maybe even customization platforms to your users. The idea is that the data is gonna keep coming from the brands. I'm gonna keep providing more and more customizations for my users, my job is to produce more and more um, central campaigns to brands. How, um, you know, how drilled down can I get to their users? And as their um, asks are going up, can I produce you know, uh, this logo in this region? Can I produce this coupon offer in this city? I have the data to understand where my user's coming from. How personalized can I get it? Well, can my technology really match it? And a tool like Shilly can really pair up providing information to the end user or providing information from my brand and really producing individualized products for those end users. 
And we think the big deal is going to be maximizing the return on investment. It's understanding that thinking outside of the box is really important. It's really understanding how can we create campaigns that mean the most. Well, these ization concepts as we go are really ways in order to think outside of the box, but they are methods in order to take advantage of how personalized can we get while maximizing profitability. We understand that everybody wants the cheapest product. We need to be able to identify how can we save costs? How can we really utilize these products as we go? And we think the more um, innovative campaigns are what's really going to be the most. Where can we save money? And so it's going to be you as the producer coming up with these concepts and providing different ways that brands can interact. Is it going to be the brand coming to you to tell you what they want to do next? Or can you be the company as the technology provider that comes to them and says, hey, we came up with a new way that we can produce our packaged goods. We figured out a way that we can really tie in this technology with this customization. And now you can take those boxes that you've been printing through us and really customizing even more. So really you as the print shop, as many tasks as you've been added to your kind of flow are often now the ones that have to be the innovators. They have to be the ones that can create these custom customer triggers, the ones that build these concepts and say, hey, brand, you work with us, but here's another great thing that you can do. Because both of you guys are working together, you as the one on the pulse, seeing what other people do, seeing other concepts, really take it to another level. So it's a, it's a communication. It's educating your brands and your customers about what's possible and at the same time is productizing these things that you, see, that you see on the shelf. So always keep in mind trying to make the most money. Always keep in mind your investments and how to take advantage of these things. But create profitable ways that you can take advantage of the trends that are going forward in order to maximize. We go back to campaigns that succeed and fail, providing the opportunity for a brand to be a market leader and to establish a concept that's never been done before, you want to be that company. You want to pair yourself up next to the brand that says, we found the next latest and greatest thing to do. So be the production house by being the innovator. So two-way communication, really sit down with your brands. And as you start to invest, as that becomes a requirement in the industry, really take advantage of the people that you're hiring, the smart minds that are there, the, the things that you see out in the market, to really creating profitability. And so as customization goes up, just do it the right way. We see it being done a lot of the ways right. We see a lot of people doing it the wrong way. It's just understanding what's uh, most effective out there in the market and understanding the best way um, to stay ahead of the game and, and really be a leader in your industry. Um, guys, about five minutes left before the end of the hour. I know that was a lot of information to grab um, in a short amount of time, but um, just want to stay Thank you in general. Uh, we have a white paper on this on our website, so feel free to check out chillypublish.com um, and uh, you can get some of the same information we talked about before. Um, my coworkers had produced this video online, so if you want to share this video with yourself or see it again, you're more than welcome to do so. But um, thank you for your attention and time tonight. Um, we'll be doing this again on Thursday. Uh, we'll also be doing more presentations as the month goes on. Uh, new year, new innovation. I'm trying to share some of our ideas of Chile out there with the world. So uh, again, thank you. And uh, we, uh, we hope uh, you share this information with your friends. Have a good night.